Welcome to Digital Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Can. I'm Jeffrey. Digital Oil and Gas looks at the impact of digital technology on the global oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Can on Twitter or at jeffreycan.com. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. My name is Jeffrey, and I'm uh, very pleased to welcome all the way from the Netherlands, outside Amsterdam, south half an hour or so from a little town called Linden, uh, Nick Verhoeven, who is the head of sales for Power D, a startup in Europe with a fascinating uh, journey to uh, on the road to electronic vehicles. And I was very keen to uh, learn today about um, the developments in that arena. So, Nick, welcome to Digital Oil and Gas. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It might seem uh, weird to be talking to a uh, battery specialist in electronic vehicles uh, on the podcast, but uh, I think it's very important for the oil and gas industry uh, to be uh, mindful of what's happening in the transportation sector because there's a direct effect on the fortunes of oil and gas. Uh, but secondly, uh, Nick, your, your background is quite special in that you uh, actually came out of the oil and gas industry. You had a, a first career there and you've transitioned over to technology. And I think there's a sort of a sub story in all of this that is worth uh, exploring because I know a number of people in oil and gas uh, do do um, wonder about that that sort of career transition. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. How does that sound? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can see you on the screen. Unfortunately, on a podcast, no one else can see you. But uh, uh, the uh, you're, you're you're working now. Did I get it right, Linden, which is in another Leiden. 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 I mispronounced it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you. No worries. And you mentioned Leiden was special for uh, for a particular reason. What is that? Well, we're really big in uh, in the medical uh, medical innovation. So a nice side story is that we, uh, a kilometer away, the, the Janssen and Janssen, uh, well, the Johnson and Johnson uh, vaccine was, yeah. uh, was made. So uh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> the world is good. The world is appreciative, I have to say. Now, let's, uh, let's get, uh, get a little bit of your personal background uh, f- uh, first, though. If you don't mind, maybe you could share uh, your, your personal story and journey about how you got to where you got to. So that it, it, I know yeah. that it did start out in oil and gas, and now you're in, you're in high tech. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so um, the last few years after, of course, uh, college, et cetera, et cetera, I worked at uh, the big French oil major. Um, I worked in um, in the energy department there. Uh, uh, and the last year, uh, I was part of, a, let's say, an internal startup, which focused on uh, 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 well solutions for people who drive EV. Mm. Um, and, uh, actually it was, a, it was a successful startup, uh, but with some, with, with what sometimes happened when, when you work, uh, in, uh, in a corporate environment still is when there are expensive projects who don't really, uh, do something for the, for the bottom line, uh, when there is some trouble along the way, um, name oil prices or <laughs> yeah. name uh, pandemic or yeah. whatever. global recession. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> All, all that innovation uh, turns to be less important. Mm. Uh, so uh, that internal, well, let's call it startup incubator, uh, stopped. Mm. And that uh, um, made me think of like how I would move uh, from there. Um, working in a, in a corporate environment is great. You, you, you can learn a lot. You can learn uh, a lot on how to get things done, how mm-hmm. to... Um, get a project from A to B, but what really, what lacks is the urgency to innovate. Um, the corporate have a big, a big, uh, continuous, um, revenue stream, which makes them reluctant to change because that could be a threat to their uh, current way of working. Um, and then when you take it to, uh, where I am right now at power D, we are completely new. We are uh, about 10 people working with us. Um, we have no uh, clear uh, revenue stream. What we have is, uh, is a group of very talented people uh, with good ideas uh, who need to make it happen <laughs> to make a successful company. Yeah, higher uh, risk, obviously. Yeah, higher risk, higher reward, if you ask me. So um, 
I'm I'm really excited to to be working with uh, uh, within such a high paced uh, environment and actually getting stuff done. Mm. As opposed to having to convince the manager of your manager of your manager. Yeah, he's in the hierarchies of of oil and gas, and and uh, you know we shouldn't be too hard on on oil and gas companies. Um, the uh, indu- large industrial concerns uniformly have the same challenge, which is uh, if you want to make a change in their economic fortunes because they're already at scale. You have to do something at scale, otherwise it just feels immaterial because it's a small thing. And uh, so as a result, it tends to stifle, as you point out, stifle the the innovative juices and energies that people have to want to drive change. Uh, It just gets very discouraging sometimes. (laughs) You have to go through these layers upon layers to get approvals done, secure financing and the like. So, but uh, but at the same time, uh, you do learn a lot. There's, I'm sure, there's some things you discovered now that you're in a startup world. Some things that you've carried over from your time in in the big oil industry that that is proving to be very valuable. What would you what would you highlight as being particularly useful skills? I would call it the the business basics. Mm. Uh, like you're, you can have a great idea, but if it doesn't mean anything on the bottom line. It's not gonna make this a success yeah. in the end, mm. um, and that that's also what I'm noticing at PowerD. We're transitioning from this great idea, these great these great techniques, into a company that's gonna make uh, a de- like, uh, well, that's gonna make a big difference yeah. in uh, um, in the in the energy transition, pretty much. Uh, but it has to mean something on the bottom line. Uh, so that mindset, the the, the um, the the need to pretty much make money off of something which is a good idea um that's the thing i i got from uh well among others but that's the one thing i got from the corporate yeah yeah that's a, a, certainly a big a, a big a, a critical success factor actually uh so, so as hard as the uh as oil industry executives like to point out if it doesn't jingle it doesn't count uh, so you, know, you, you, know, yeah. you got to turn it into a cash register at some point. But you know, there's other skills I think that you pick up along the way. Um, I'm thinking about project management, just as one just one idea. You you learn learn some skills. What what was your role at at um, in the energy world uh, before you left? Uh, you said you were in, in energy in in Total. What, what did what what exactly did that mean? So the the branch I worked at supplied uh, gas and power. For the uh, for the B two B company well, for, uh, for for company yep um, and the the project I worked on what I said uh, supplied uh, charging solutions for electric vehicles uh, for both B two C and B two B markets mm. uh, and my role there was um, uh, what well, we called it digital sales and marketing manager so yep. pretty much. Um, Everything from uh, from a Google ad to uh, changing the proposition uh, at least uh, went through my hands. Yeah, uh, which which gave me a really good uh, uh, a really good view on the Dutch uh, electric market, um, which of course helped me a lot in my uh, in my in my current my current role. role yeah, already. exactly. Mm-hmm. And what is the future of electric vehicles in? The Netherlands. And, and by the way, I want just to relay a little story of my own personal experience. I was in Amsterdam. Um, I'm trying to can't remember the dates, uh, but I the first thing I noticed when I was in the taxi queue to take my taxi to uh, to the hotel was a Tesla Model S <laughs> was was yep. the taxi, and yep. so this was this was a shock to me because of the first time it had been the second time I'd been in a Model S. One was at a, a demo. Um, event for a Tesla years ago when the car first came out. But to actually be in one in a taxi was a shock. Yep. Uh, so for those of us who don't get to travel as much now, <laughs> with it, Teslas are taxis as one of their uh, one of their key solutions. So, uh, but this unlocks this whole question: What is the future of electric vehicles in in Europe? And maybe you have a perspective on that. Yeah, actually, it's a um, that's a great example to make it really uh, uh, tangible on how the transition is going. Yeah, uh, our our national airport Schiphol had uh, well the taxi service has invested in a huge amount of Teslas oh. um, to to drive people from the airport to where they need to go. 
uh, which are typically dri- like our, our drives into Amsterdam, which is um, let's say a half hour drive. Yeah, it's not far um, actually. Yeah. All these short distances, you, you can know where you, you feel where I'm going, are great for electric vehicles. Mm-hmm. So it made perfect sense to invest in those vehicles who are also cheaper to drive and have less maintenance um, as to, to invest in Teslas. And there are actually fast chargers on the airport. So those taxi cabs can charge really, fa- really quick mm-hmm. during a lunch break or, uh, mm-hmm. or just getting a coffee. Uh, so that's a great example where um, we as a country are going uh, with EV is um, right now there are 300,000 electric vehicles in the Netherlands. Um, last year, 20% of all our new cars were already EVs or hybrids. Um, there are around 65 thousand charging stations public charging stations right now wow um and a little under two hundred thousand uh private charging uh stations for people who uh who have that have a driveway oh so if you're <clears throat> by that you mean a garage or a place where you can park your vehicle and plug it in it's your station yeah. others can't yeah. use it mm. yeah yeah exactly right. two hundred thousand so, um, yeah. It's, it's a huge number. As you're almost at a, uh, just doing the math in my head here, you're almost at one charge point per vehicle. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah, a little less. Uh, we, a little less, but... Um, yeah. A little less. If you, if you would go, if you would uh, ignore the private uh, stations, it's yeah. like, it's already one to, one to six. One to six, yeah. yeah. So uh, one, one charging, uh, charging <laughs> station for every uh, uh, six cars. Yeah. Um, which works out great for now. I have a, I drive a Nissan Leaf at the moment, and uh, um, it's really easy for me to find a charging station. It's a, it's a few hundred meters from me walking uh, walking uh, from my house. Mm. Um, so that's great. This is all numbers, though. Um, where we're going uh, when if if uh, by two thousand thirty uh, we are a lot well there there are no. Um, you can only buy an electric car. That's what I was going to say. Mm. So you cannot buy a combustion engine anymore. So no so, hybrid, no hybrids either. I'm not sure about the hybrids, but for sure the fossil, the fossil burners only are not allowed to be sold anymore as a public car or as, as a private, yeah, as a private car in the Netherlands. So that's a really big uh, dot at the horizon uh, for car for car makers uh, for OEMs themselves yeah. to realize that they can develop new cars but they cannot be sold in the Netherlands if they're not EV. Mm. Uh, so the adoption of electric cars are going to really go uh, are going to grow even more as they are right, growing right now. Yeah. Um, so and then what's going to uh, lead that to? Um, is that we're going to have more people charging their cars. We're going uh, into into the solution of power D uh, slowly. I I, I feel. Um, <laughs> but, but that's, that's but okay. A, but that's okay. I mean, this is the this is the question of the day. So so this is the driver on the horizon, as you say, the dot on the horizon. It's going to come very quickly, uh, and um, and this raises all kinds of questions. How do people charge their vehicles? Um, I mean, today, you know, if it's a fossil fuel car, you <clears throat> the, the fuel is identical regardless of what fuel station you go to, and yeah. so you refill wherever you need. Um, and uh, so, how does how do we how do we take that experience and we project it into a, um, a an electric vehicle future, which is where Power D is headed? So maybe you could elaborate yeah. a little bit about this. And what is the road to zero here that is uh, Power D wants to play a role in? Yeah. Yeah, and the road to zero is a road to uh, zero CO two, of course. Yeah. Um, so when you drive a, a, an electric, well, not a non-electric car, so a regular car for now, mm-hmm. you go, you have to go get your gas at a gas station. Uh, at the gas station, that's where the only where only, only place uh, you can buy it. That's the only place yep. you can buy it. Um, EVs, there. Uh, EVs, you have to. You, you can go pretty much anywhere. Right now, you can go charge at your friend's home. You can charge. You can go fast charging if you need to on the highway. Um, so there's a lot more possibilities. There's uh, no control for big oil uh, as right now. So um, what, what do you mean by that? No, what do you mean by no control for big oil? What does that mean? Um, what I mean is like there. Um, 
there's a monopoly on where you can get gas. Yes. Yes. Right now. Brass. Yes. That, but the, the, it's only available through the big oil d distribution outlets. That's it. Yep. And uh, yep. that changes completely once you move to electric vehicles. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. So um, what we are right doing right now at PowerD is we are supplying our customers with a charging station and uh, electric uh, or a contract for your gas and power for your home. Why that mm. is so important is that means that we can control the timing when your electric vehicle is going to be charged. Because um, imagine if all our electric cars right now who have um, a private uh, private private driveway yeah. start charging at six in the six in the evening, it's gonna this is gonna create like a huge demand on the energy network we have. Um, which means there's going to be a higher demand of energy that our green energy production at the moment will be able to uh, to cope with. Mm. So to make to, to to make sure there's no blackout, which won't happen, uh, all our gas uh, gas power stations have to turn a little bit higher to accommodate for all that extra energy we're asking for. Mm. This is how it goes. Um, if you well, this is how it goes. Uh, if you don't do anything, um, anything with it, so pretty much you you plug in your car at six in the evening, just how you plug in your uh, your iPhone when you're when you need to charge it. Yeah. Um, hmm. To to spread that peak, what we are doing, we you can uh, use our app and say, um, I don't care how you charge it, but I need to have it charged uh, by tomorrow morning. So what we do, we, we take all our electric cars uh, who have um, filled in their request on how they want their car to be charged. And we look at uh, favorable moments during the night where we can charge the car. So there will be no peak between six and nine when it's uh, really busy, people come home, people yep. start to cook, watch TV, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and we use the energy, which is available at between two or two and five a.m when the wind is blowing and everyone's sleeping mm -hmm. to charge all our cars. Mm, right on. Um, mm. Yeah. In the, I know that there's a, there's a phenomenon <clears throat> in the UK that's widely noted, uh, which is that to be, uh, during when, when football matches are on, so for North Americans out there, soccer, but in Europe, football, <laughs> but during the break yeah, yeah. on football, uh, <clears throat> the British population stands up en masse and goes to the kitchen and plugs in the electric kettle. <laughs> and the, you could actually watch the grid fluctuate as all of these power devices at the same time uh, start to draw power. So your Power D's idea here, observation is, what happens when you have not just a kettle, you know, <laughs> <laughs> for for a boiling hot water, but all of these electric vehicles at the same time. The the unless we think creatively about this, uh, we do run the risk of putting a great strain on the on on the grid. Um, wh where is the so as you kind of lay this all out? What what are the building blocks that uh, allow you to do this sort of thing? Um, I mean the app obviously because you you know you're you're distributing that the the charge mm -hmm. station. What what's in behind all of this to make this work? Um, pretty much, we build a smart algorithm that chooses mm. the right right times during the during during, during the overnight car could yep. be charged yep. uh, to actually charge. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the I that's the big brain behind all the uh, behind our solution. Uh, the, the the physical will be the charging station. Yep. The let's say near physical is the app, which you can use right now to. Uh, to communicate with us when you want your car to be charged. Mm -hmm. It's good to know that uh, Teslas already have the ability to tell that to us automatically. So they say, hey, my, my, well, my battery is uh, at 40%. Yep. My driver wants it to be at 80% in the morning, which is great because that saves people the hassle of uh, putting in the numbers themselves. Yes. And we are working with, uh, with other OEMs to have that connection um, as soon as possible to make it even easier for everyone to use our uh, to use our services. Mm -hmm. Can you do things like, um, like if you're if you're the vehicle owner, could you say, for instance, I have a specific power contract um, that specifies only green power, for instance, mm -hmm. and so I will only use green power. Is that part of the part of the the algorithm? It's a great question. Actually, with our services, we provide 
uh, a green energy contract. Yeah, of course. Which yeah. is only supplied by uh, PPAs, power purchase agreements, mm-hmm. um, which in which in short means that you have allocated uh, a consumption from an actual wind farm, which you which you have purchased from that wind farm a certain yep. amount of energy. Mm-hmm. So it's. Uh, uh, well, you can actually drive to that wind farm where your energy uh, has come from in the past period, um, which makes it, well, yeah, which makes it, the, the I, it's hard to say, but the best green energy, which, because you actually invested into making um, making the energy, energy transition possible by mm-hmm. funding, uh, green, funding green a energy solar, solar yeah. farm or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. or wind farm. Um, hmm. That's and of course, this is the only way how it would make sense. Because if you charge a car uh, with with ag- average power, it would be gray power, which is produced coal. not only yeah. by uh, by green, so yeah. uh, by coal, by gas, etc. Yeah, there's a um, the the other phenomenon that I know about in Europe is the the sh- the, 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 f- the the ability for Europeans to travel. But because the borders are, are no longer exist, I think they probably might exist in the pandemic. But <laughs> in a pre-pandemic world, uh, you can yep. drive from France to to the Netherlands without stopping. Uh, mm-hmm. So that suggests that your car, your future car, electric car, mm-hmm. you'll you'll you may be an Amsterdam resident, but you you may need to purchase power for your vehicle outside of the Netherlands. How does yep. uh, how do you see that world unfolding with uh, with this? Innovation. Actually, I, I, I traveled to France with my girlfriend with our electric car uh, last summer, where we're still allowed. Um, and that's actually, it's really easy because uh, there are a lot of high power charging stations in Europe. Uh, on the highway place system? Right now, on the highways. Yeah. Mm. Um, so then what you do, you break up your, your, your journey into uh, into three hours drive, half hour charging. And then, uh, well, pretty much before you know it, you'll be in France and... Uh, uh, that's all. That's all really good taken care of at the moment, and the cars will have a better range in the future, and there will be more charging stations in the future. Yeah. So it's only going to be easier. Yeah. So not only better better range, um, but faster charging in addition to the you know, more frequent the ability to stop in more more frequent areas. Um, yeah. yeah. And what did, what do you see as some of the challenges uh, out there that need to be solved? Uh, that that are you know uh, in in the if you like the structural things that we need to overcome so that we can move to this kind of fluidity in in electric vehicle um, charging. Um, well, to make it really small at first, uh, what we do is uh, um, it's really complex. Mm. Uh, but but explaining it to uh, to John with the Tesla <laughs> could be really easy. Uh, but then if you explain it too easy. Does it really communicate the value that we actually bring? Yeah. Uh, so that's a challenge um, we're working on a daily basis, pretty much, just just to <laughs> how do we make it <laughs> explain the value? It, yeah. So like, how do we make it as um, as convincing as possible that our solution is actually better than what you have right now? Uh, and that's communicating values as uh, you don't have to pay your charging of your car bill yourself and get it back from your employer. Your employer will get the bill himself. Mm. Uh, you'll get only green energy in your car. Actually talking about the employer, we we in the Netherlands have companies who have uh, a net zero ambition themselves. Yep. So for them, there is a great incentive to have their uh, employees drive electric cars. Mm. But that's step one, because you don't know if, uh, if the energy which goes into the cars is actually green. And that's exactly the area where you come in. We are able to prove to the employer that the car that the employee moves around in to get to his appointments is actually green. And the car, in this case, for the employer, this is a vehicle that the employee would use for their business, right? Yeah. It's for it's work 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 vehicle, if you like, to 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 go to visit customers or uh, production sites or what have you. Um, this is what in uh, I think in the in the carbon world is called a scope two emission. Um, so a scope scope one would be I have a furnace in my facility and it I, it burns gas and it heats my facility. 
Um, scope two is uh, my employees in their vehicles. I can't control the vehicle directly, but, uh, but, but as you say, so, some European companies are being very explicit. They are aiming to encourage their employees as much as possible to drive vehicles that allow them to reduce their, uh, their footprint. I think that's a very powerful uh, message for the world to hear, which is yeah. um, you, can, you can aim in this direction and, and it's reasonable to get there. How does, uh, is there, what about the, there's another challenge I'm watching out there and that we saw this most recently in Houston uh, with a terrible winter storm. People who had electric vehicles were actually able to wheel their power off their electric vehicle back into yeah. their household to, 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 to provide home fuel, if you like, during the cold weather. Yeah. Yeah. Is that something yeah. you also see as a customer value proposition? Um, that, definitely, that, yeah. definitely. It's a great question. This is a... Um, a question that goes into uh, our future goals, because mm. um, of course it would be uh, great to be able to uh, uh, to use your car to keep your fridge going when there's a blackout. <laughs> yes, um, it's even greater to be able to uh, imagine that you have uh, you have a full car. You have a full. Your your battery is going to be full. Mm. You get home. Uh, you plug in your car, which kind of doesn't make sense, but you do it. Uh, and then in, instead of getting your power from the grid, uh, you're going to get it from your own, uh, from your own car, mm. which, is, which is, which is great. That's uh, step one. So mm. your car is going to be empty by the, by the end of the night because yeah. you watch TV, you did whatever. Um, then during that night, your car will be filled by power from, uh, from a wind farm mm -hmm. close by. Uh, so your power, well, when it's when it's morning, your car is going to be full again with green energy, and you go. For instance, you can drive to your uh, to your appointments. You 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 stop at your office. Right then, you, you charge your car again with solar power from the roof of your office, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you return home again, mm -hmm. and then supply the green power from your office, which otherwise otherwise could have been lost because who is using a lot of power during the day. Not as much people, but they're going to use it by between six and nine in the evening. Mm -hmm. um, so this vehicle to grid, personally, I see it as the holy grail uh, because it connects your house, um, well, it connects your car with your, with the energy grid, mm -hmm. and it's gonna make sure we use our green power as best as possible. It's gonna save us a lot of money because we don't have to. Uh, beef up the net the, the grid actually because um, if you consume and produce locally you don't have to well, pretty much big make big cables from the power uh, centrals to to us because mm -hmm. uh, we produce and consume in our own local ecosystems yeah this is a, the, the relationship that people have with energy is really at the edge of of going through a, a dramatic change most people today do not know where their energy comes from, haven't a clue. No, okay. no, and they, they'll, they will know soon enough because <laughs> it, will, it will come either from their car or from their, uh, uh, from their solar panels on their roof. Mm -hmm. And actually one of our, um, let's say we're actually thinking about how we can empower people to, uh, to be pretty much the master of their own power. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> as a as a business model or as a business concept yeah why not yeah yeah because right now you're you're like you depend on some gas um gas plant somewhere owned by a really big company who tells you what to pay when to pay um and pretty much it you have no you have no control over over, over whatsoever in that process you're just the consumer mm -hmm. uh, and with our solutions we're having in place right now and also the solutions we'll have in the future uh, you'll become um, you'll become the master of your own power yeah master of your own power <clears throat> that's an, a, an interesting way to think about this uh, this future world of energy uh, because it, it, it implies a change in so many uh, elements in, uh, of the relationship with with power. Uh, in fact, something that's even missing, uh, which you may may be picking up in in your work too, is uh, the power utility today uh, doesn't have a, a great understanding of their actual customers. They they, they sell b l large quantities of power, but uh, they mm -hmm. don't really understand the customer. But once you start inserting a car into the mix. Uh, you now have potentially 
um, great insight into um, the, their vehicle usage, uh, their patterns of behavior, their consumption needs. Uh, you, you should be able to construct far more clever solutions and offers to those consumers to ease their lifestyle. Uh, and all of that is now becoming on the table. <laughs> yeah. It hasn't been yeah. possible. Now suddenly it's here. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think that's the, because um, we're in the podcast talking, which usually you've been talked about on uh, <laughs> For Big Oil. Yes. So this is yes. The, the nice, the, the great bridge and a great opportunity that Big Oil has. Um, they they're they're experiencing and they will experience a big challenge in how to make revenue again, how to stay in touch with my customers who won't be going to the gas stations anymore because mm-hmm. uh, they don't need them. Uh, they do have a really great relationship with mobility itself. If you uh, if you if you if you um, trying to come up with a, a great oil major, if you Exxon, if mm-hmm. people think about Exxon, they know that mobility makes sense. Um, but does it make sense that Exxon will provide your uh, electricity for you at home? Probably not so much. Um, but if you explain to your customer that Exxon has made this great solution where you can uh, get your mobility services from, even though when you have an electric car, mm-hmm. um, and they will, they, they can use their uh, their branding, their strength, their familiarity with the mobility market. There is a huge opportunity to uh, to still be to still engage those customers who you would have otherwise lost. Yeah, there are big, there's big changes coming to the oil industry. Is what this is all saying is, and, and you can see the early stages of it uh, unfolding in the Netherlands. Uh, Nick, it's been great yeah. to have you on the podcast today to talk a little bit about uh, the future of mobility, uh, batteries, electric vehicles, charge solutions, uh, mobility as a service, the future for oil and gas in this world. Uh, if people want to learn more about uh, PowerD, where do they go? It's, what's, what's the website? They go to PowerD.io. Um, .io. We have an English version, so uh, no worries about that. <laughs> Um, if you have more, if you have more in-depth questions, uh, feel free to reach out uh, to me uh, personally. Uh, I'm happy to uh, to give you any other insights. Brilliant. And so uh, that brings to a close this podcast. Nick, thanks again for coming on and sharing yeah. the story with us today. Thank you. If you like what you've heard, uh, please press the like button or leave a comment for myself or Nick. We'll get back back to you. And better yet, share this with your favorite oil company so that they can hear (laughs) about the future of electrified transportation and what it's going to mean for the mobility industry. I'll return next week with another episode. Bye for now. 